2001 A Space Odyssey is a film about self-overcoming, the evolution of man, and the human drive to create something beyond ourselves, but it's also about getting abducted by aliens. A two-headed dog with six legs. So yeah, I take the alien perspective, but so is the book. And so does the short stories it's based on, and so does the script, and so does the author of the book. And in 2001, Stanley Kubrick and I have set ourselves several objectives. We want to convey the message that our Earth is perhaps not the only abode of life. The sun that shines on this planet is one of a hundred billion surfing in the Milky Way. How many of those shine upon our equals or our masters? So is the production history, and so is the author of the film who paid the author of the book to write the book. But yeah, that's probably what's going on at the end of the film. Um, he is uh, taken in by uh, uh, godlike entities, uh, creatures of pure uh, energy and intelligence with no shape or form. And um, they uh, put him uh, in what I suppose you could describe as a human zoo. And uh, to study him, and he spends he, his whole life passes from that point on in that room. Astronaut David Bowman is in a zoo for humans made from his own memories and imagination, and these aliens abduct him and move him into the next step of human evolution. But first, they turn him into a metaphor, and we'll get to that. That's what's going on at the surface level according to Kubrick, since an encounter with the advanced interstellar intelligence would be incomprehensible within our present earthbound frames of reference, reactions to it will have elements of philosophy and metaphysics and will have nothing to do with the bare plot outline itself. We are going to get into some more abstract philosophy, but Kubrick was really into aliens, which is, you know, super cool. I like aliens, and I like how these aliens might have looked. And we have interviews saying that they just decided not to depict the aliens because of money and inability to convey what they wanted to. There would be some kind of an encounter. Aliens would appear. They would manifest in some way. But we never got to it. We simply ran out of time and money. Kubrick's wife even did some of the designs here. Good job, Kubrick's wife. But that's why we don't see aliens, and that's why they're still aliens, even if we don't see the aliens. Yeah, now I would say that we do see the alien starships. Those diamond things look like UFOs to me. In fact, that's probably what the diamond things are, considering that at one point they tried to experiment depicting aliens the same way. On the red carpet premiere, Kubrick talked about aliens. Yeah, he was quite open about that aspect of the film. Well, I became interested in the idea that <clears throat> the universe uh, was full of intelligent civilizations, which is the current scientific belief. In fact, there was a 20-minute prologue to 2001 about scientists talking about the possibilities of alien life in the far reaches of the universe. This was axed by Kubrick after the premiere. We still have some of the interviews, at least their transcripts. This is not the only thing that was axed. There was narration talking about the aliens. We know what the narration said due to the script. Stanley Kubrick would later return to one of these alien designs during the pre-production phase of AI, which Steven Spielberg would employ after Kubrick's passing. Prior to the production in 1964, Stanley Kubrick was so convinced of the possibilities of extraterrestrial life and the human's ability to meet them that he tried to take out an insurance policy in the event that alien intelligence was found prior to the film's release. Can you imagine making that phone call, telling your insurance provider that aliens might ruin your film? And it was no joke. Kubrick believed that the possibility was out there. Before we start this analysis proper, I have to do two things. One, to remind you to hit that subscribe button if you want more of this content. And second, we have to understand why Kubrick, an atheist, wanted to tell this alien story in a style mirroring a cosmic tale of spiritual rebirth. In interviews following the film's release, we can find an almost religious enthrallment to what may lie beyond by the creators of the film. Kubrick even links the possibilities of highly evolved alien species to be equivalent to gods. When asked about critics who dismiss the film, Kubrick states something pretty out of character. He states, perhaps there is a certain element of a lump in Lerati that is so dogmatically atheist and materialist and earthbound that it finds the grandeur of space and the myriad mysteries of cosmic intelligence anathema. Which is a super weird thing for him to say, considering Kubrick was known to be very, very much an atheist. 
This might point us into the right direction as I see a somewhat spiritual idealization 2001. Not in any like traditional sense. Rather, Kubrick was very much interested in the concept of aliens as a guiding, almost theistic force. According to Kubrick, the god concept is at the heart of 2001, but not in a traditional anthropomorphic image of God. I don't believe in any of Earth's monotheistic religions, but I do believe that one can construct an intriguing scientific definition of God. When you think of the giant technological strides that man has made in a few millennia less than a microsecond in the chronology of the universe, can you imagine the evolutionary developments that much older life forms have taken? They may have progressed from biological species, which are fragile shells for the mind at best, into moral machine entities, and then they could emerge from the chrysalis of matter, transformed into beings of pure energy and spirit. Their potentialities would be limitless and their intelligence ungraspable by humans. Judging by the script that alien gods were made from radiation, as he described here, Kubrick believed that biological entities could develop beyond the scope of the material. This explains why he went after critics' atheism, but also their understanding of materialism. Maybe, therefore, that is why Kubrick latched onto projects such as The Shining. Ghosts are an equally non-materialist concept. Not minimizing that movie to just be about ghosts, just, you know, observation. Anyways, from air views, we can ascertain that these aliens evolved beyond space and time. In the novel, 2001, the baby dubbed the Star Child understands the world beyond the scope of three dimensions. The Star Child, once enlightened, sees the slab to be much more than a slab of rock. He states, how obvious now was the mathematical ratio of its sides, the quadratic sequence 1 by 4 by 9, and how naive to have imagined that the series ended there in only three dimensions. What the Star Child is talking about when it comes to going beyond the third dimension may be what is being depicted here in the Stargate sequence. To Bowman, the slab is an object that literally takes one's perspective beyond the philosophical, metaphysical, and intellectual understanding of the universe, like a, like a doorway or something beyond man. This was also a huge element of what Arthur C. Clarke's writing output was about at the time. Arthur C. Clarke, who co-authored the first treatment of the script, wrote the science fiction classic Childhood's End. Uh, this book is very much in line with the concepts of evolution and alien life that we see in 2001 The Space Odyssey. Kubrick wanted to adapt Childhood's End into a film, but he was unable to secure the rights. Instead, Kubrick adapted The Sentinel and The Encounter in the Dawn, both being short stories with similar themes to the film. Childhood's End surrounds a benevolent galactic overseer who oversees man's next evolution. Man's evolutionary destiny is for man to join a vast cosmic intelligence that exists beyond the material. Clark wasn't the only notable person who worked on 2001. Carl Sagan, late great scientific figurehead and UFO skeptic, was consulted in how the aliens could look. But honestly, looking back, it makes sense that Kubrick took a liking to Sagan and Arthur C. Clarke. Dr. Strangelove, Kubrick's previous film, was originally going to have aliens narrating the story. The aliens would use Earth's nuclear war as a cautionary tale to their own populace, and Dr. Strangelove was going to be a sort of alien history lesson. The reason I imagine this was cut was most likely because aliens telling you from the outset the Earth blew up would lose the dramatic suspense which literally carries the entire movie. So right away, we are already getting some behind the scenes stuff with aliens worrying about humans with the nuclear bomb in Dr. Strangelove and aliens midwifing humans into entities beyond the material in Childhood's End. This could tie into our interpretation with 2001. This is especially a factor since the alien star child circles around the Earth at the end of the movie like an orbiting nuclear satellite. Whether the star child blows up these nuclear satellites or 
takes man into the next evolution is up to our imagination. In the book, the Star Child dispatches all the nuclear satellites once it returns from its odyssey, much like Odysseus dispatches all of Penelope's suitors once he returns home. The killing of a technological hydra, the HAL 9000, foreshadows the blowing up of these satellites. However, we don't see that at the end of the movie. We just see a baby looking at the Earth and then looking past the camera. Since we do see Bowman kill Hal, a murderous machine, perhaps Bowman would come in peace and kill another murderous machine, preventing nuclear war? But I think the intention here is that the baby is going to destroy the nuclear warheads. Since the movie's first evolution leads into a nuclear satellite in the stratosphere, and the next evolution leads with the baby circling around the earth. It, it, it at least visually makes sense. Yeah, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. In one interview, Kubrick says that the child will bring about man's next evolution. So there you have it. Clark takes a different approach in his sequel book. Man still remains in the material, and America still remains at war with Russia. But as far as the 1968 film, I would say that the ambiguous nature of the ending can be understood with some clues already in the movie. See this alien-like woman grabbing this sleeping bureaucrat's pen? The alien-like woman returns a symbol of diplomacy to the government official. Stanley Kubrick believed that aliens could transfigure man into a new form of life, perhaps a more peaceful form. The way we see the character Haywood R. Floyd here in front of a monitor makes it look like he's driving a car, however, he's asleep at the wheel. there isn't much going on, one being a dispute at a wiring hole, two, the monkeys are hungry, only eating a vegetarian diet, three, they are prey to this jaguar. The monkeys wake up and see this block thing, so the, the question arises, what is this block? Well, in the book they call it the monolith, so we'll just call it that. Its purpose is to teach the apes how to use tools. We as the audience understand this with the language of these sets of shots. One of the monkey looking at the tool, two, a cutaway to the monolith, and three, back to the monkey where it uses the tool. So that's why it is in utility narratively. One, it gives knowledge. It's kind of like a telephone or a communication device. It calls out to the apes. Communication is a huge motif in the film. Keep this in mind. We'll get to that in like a long, long while. But as in terms of who's giving the knowledge? Well, two, it's of alien origin. It flies through space, reminding us of a UFO. But design-wise, well, why does it stand this way? Why does it stand up vertically? Well, the apes reach for it, the moon-based scientists reach for it, the old astronaut David Bowman reaches for it. It's labeled as a stargate in the book. Kubrick calls it that too. Keyword is gate. During the stargate sequence, there is a divide in the screen like a set of doors. So three, it's, it's a doorway of some sort. In fact, when people are reaching for it, they are reaching for it like they are reaching for a door handle. It looks like a door. Actually, since it's black, it looks like an open door. We see many black doorways mirroring the monolith's door-like quality. Some uh, doorways are horizontal, some are vertical, much like we see with the Divide and the Stargate sequence. This signals an altered perspective to a new mode of thinking. These doorways can sometimes be framed at the edge of the screen, like as a passageway outside the world of the film, signaling that alien contact has potential in taking humans beyond their metaphysical perspective. This is similar to how Bowman saw the world beyond three dimensions in the book. The apes themselves couldn't begin to imagine how to use tools, much like Bowman couldn't begin to comprehend the brilliant lights of the Stargate. Again, Kubrick states that there are elements of philosophy and metaphysics that have nothing to do with the bare plot outline itself, so this may be half of what he's talking about. 
However, it should be noted that the moon scientists are unable to pass through this door. Only David Bowman can leave this frame. We see at the end of the film a fourth wall break. The camera goes outside the set here. This signals a monumental shift in cosmic understanding. David Bowman here seems to have gained a perspective greater than the world he once occupied, but this fourth wall break also could allude to the zoo enclosure he has been living in, and it most likely does. From here, we go through the monolith-like uh, door, and lo and behold, we see the audience's next evolutionary step, the moon. Many of the earlier drafts was just a faux documentary about flight to the moon. Kubrick originally wanted to adapt Shadow of the Sun, which involved, um, 12-foot-tall lizard aliens that, that came from, that came from Jupiter. Hmm. All right. But then Arthur C. Clarke got involved, and the rest is history. But anyways, here we cross an evolutionary threshold, hence why the monolith is shaped like a door. Every time we see the monolith, there is a potential for evolution. The door first appears to us with the planetary alignments as to signify a powerful godly presence. In childhood's end, the aliens were able to shape the cosmos with their will. Perhaps these aliens are doing the same. I don't know. Either way, the door is shown with what I'm guessing is a waning crescent moon, perhaps alluding to the beginning of the monkey's next evolutionary cycle. The next cycle would be a new moon. The enlightenment signifier of the sun is on the other side of this door. In the words of Stanley Kubrick in a 1969 interview with Joseph Gilmas, when the surviving astronaut Bowman ultimately reaches Jupiter, this artifact sweeps him into a force field or stargate that hurls him on a journey through inner and outer space and finally transports him into another part of the galaxy where he's placed in a human zoo, approximating a hospital terrestrial environment drawn out of his own dreams and imagination. In a timeless state, his life passes from middle age to senescence to death. He is reborn, a enhanced being, a star child, an angel, a superman, if you like, and returns to Earth prepared for the next leap forward of man's evolutionary destiny. Okay, that's huge what he just said. He doesn't just say it once here, he repeats this a decade later in this interview with Japanese filmmaker Junuchi Yao. He is transformed into some kind of super being yes. and sent back to um, Earth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, transformed and, and made, um, you know, into some sort of superman. Yes. Uh, and we, not, we have to only guess what happens when he goes back. Reason why this matters is the same terminology of the evolutionary steps leading ape to man to Superman was used by German philosopher Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche. One of the biggest ideas in Nietzsche is that of the Übermensch, which is loosely defined in English as Superman or Overman. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to use the word Superman because that's what Kubrick is using. But Overman is a better translation. The Superman is a metaphor. It's not a literal superhero we're talking about. Uh, Superman is a concept surrounding what we as individuals can climb to, hence why I like the term overman. Frederick Nietzsche writes, What is ape to man? A laughingstock, thing of shame. And just the same shall man be to the Superman. A laughingstock, a thing of shame. The Superman was talked about most prominently by Nietzsche in his philosophical treaty, also Sprague's Zarathustra, which might be ringing some alarm bells for some people because that's the title track to the movie written by composer Richard Strauss. Richard Strauss wrote the piece in celebration of Nietzschean philosophy. Richard Strauss's tone poem signals both major evolutionary leaps in the narrative. 
Kubrick himself distantly references Nietzschean philosophy in one of his many biographies, stating, man must strive to gain mastery over himself as well as over his machines. Somebody has said that man is the missing link between primitive apes and civilized human beings. You might say that that idea is inherent in 2001. That someone was Nietzsche. N N Nietzsche said that. Nietzsche said, man is something that shall be overcome. Man is a rope tied between beast and Superman, a rope over an abyss. Nietzsche goes on to say, we sleepwalkers of the day, we artists, we who conceal naturalness, we who are moon and God struck, we untiring wanderers on heights that we see not as heights, but as our planes, as our safety. Nietzsche saw himself awakened among sleepers. He dreamed of becoming like a god among men and wanting to have the ability to meet the heights of the moon. Nietzsche here states that other people's highest heights are his flat planes. Nietzsche's goal for humanity was a reevaluation of what is valuable. And what he saw as valuable was the act of creating. The technology of space flight is seen at close range. Hence why Kubrick is using Nietzschean philosophy as an allegorical template to persuade people to overcome themselves and reach the stars. To Nietzsche, what is great in man is that he is a bridge and not an end. Nietzsche believed that we are not fully evolved. Nietzsche saw humans between something bigger and that we should push ourselves forward. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The driving force that pushes ourselves forward is what Nietzsche called the will to power. The will to power is a psychological principle that is the driving force of all life. It surrounds all life's drive to strive to grow, spread, seize, and become predominant. The will to power is not one thing. It's not just survival. It's not just violent forms or soft power. It's everything that involves overcoming resistance. Overcoming yourself is also the will to power. Okay, so what is power? Power is a drive that is both based in evolutionary psychology and our psychosexual instincts which lead us to want to assert ourselves onto our environment. Nietzsche may have believed it came at our root cellular level. The psychological principle, this will, is the driving force of all life. According to Nietzsche, it even precedes the will to survive. The will to expand one's influence is the drive of all things. You hear those birds chirping? Fooled you. That's actually the will to power. There's a lot of nuances here. Power can be power over others, or power over one's environment, or power and control over oneself. This control over oneself is self-mastery and self-overcoming. That is the way of the Superman. To Nietzsche, all that is good, all that affirms life, is built from exercising will, and that all that is bad is born from weakness. The Superman's values are values of creation, such as strength and power and the will to survive. Bad values are weakness, cowardness, or anything that doesn't lend people the ability to overcome resistance. Weakness is an inability to exercise this will. Danger! 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 Will to power. The will to power is a nuanced concept surrounding the innate drive to expand power. An innate thing to all life. Nietzsche doesn't advocate the pursuit of thuggish power, like stealing, murdering, raping, but rather taking this drive to power and subliminating this drive into creative projects that are life-affirming. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. For instance, creating art, venturing off to new worlds, pushing to something beyond yourself. As he gets ready to walk out to the arena and the 3,000 people who are there, Walter is slowly becoming another man. This is the man who cannot lose. The hard movements of his arms and fists are different from what they were an hour ago. They belong to a fierce new person. They're part of the arena man. 
Now, Nietzsche says the world is the will to power and nothing besides. And you yourself are also this will to power and nothing besides. Two, one, zero, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour. Bowman reaches the end of the galaxy and back, like the boxer who went to the limit in Stanley Kubrick's first short film. He overcomes what others couldn't and sees the world in a new light, literally in a new dimension, like we do when we first discover the world. Nietzsche's ideal is a shrugging off of what is weakness and burdening and living in rediscovery without regret. Nietzsche poses a challenge. If one could live the same life over and over and over again, would you want to? Would this be a blessing or a curse? Think of the will to power it must take to land a man on the moon, to exert yourself over that environment. The apes killing the tapers to get food is overcoming resistance. The apes at the wiring hole is overcoming resistance. That bird chirping, he's trying to find a mate part of the innate drive for evolutionary success. David Bowman going through the pod bay doors and shutting off Howe. These are all examples of self-overcoming. Frederick Nietzsche once wrote, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. The philosophy of the Superman was in response to the apathy and nihilism in our lives. The problem we find ourselves in is modernity and a lack of meaning in it. Just one of the major reasons for this lack of meaning was because of the age of enlightenment. The more humans became educated to their surroundings, the more we became disillusioned to our world. Kubrick echoes these thoughts. Cynicism, loss of spiritual values, two world wars, the communist disillusionment, psychoanalysis. If the modern world could be summed up with a single word, it would be absurd. The only truly creative response to this world is the comic version of life. Kubrick labels himself as an absurdist, something that we could totally see with Dr. Strangelove. Kubrick talks about the human condition of the then modern man in an interview with Playboy in 1968. I read it for the articles. Perhaps man has been too liberated by science and evolutionary social trends. He has been turned loose from religion and has hailed the death of his gods. The imperative loyalties of the old nation states are dissolving and all the old social and ethical values, however reactionary and narrow they often were, are disappearing. Man in the 20th century has been cut adrift in a rudderless boat on an uncharted sea. Kubrick here calls a lack of religiosity the death of God, which is in reference to Frederick Nietzsche. It's, it's like literally the most famous thing he's ever said. It's not a flub either. Kubrick deliberately uses the terminology in multiple instances in this interview. Even Eric Norton mentions Nietzsche in this conversation calling 2001 a Nietzschean film. This isn't a unpopular opinion, by the way. I'm definitely not the first one to take this perspective. Death of God was a concept in which Nietzsche characterizes modern man's lack of religiousness. This doesn't mean that God tripped down the stairs and broke his neck. When Kubrick, Nietzsche, or I am using the phrase death of God, this means that God is metaphorically dead in the eyes of most men. That because of this, there are no grand narratives holding the world together. When Nietzsche said this, he wasn't celebrating it. This lack of meaning is alienating and bad. According to Nietzsche, this doesn't mean we should seek out God, because according to Nietzsche, there wasn't ever a God. Nietzsche, like Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke, were all atheists. The difference between Nietzsche and Clark and Kubrick's atheism is that Clark and Kubrick seem to believe in the possibilities of higher beings that could have the power of God. Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke here seems to idealistically believe that humans could co-evolve or marry with these aliens, or how Kubrick puts it, achieve some sort of transfiguration into a higher form of life. Kubrick even sometimes talked about how, say, 200 years from now, we could send out our DNA via radio and genetically modify ourselves. Again, this is an atheistic concept of God we're talking about. Stanley Kubrick was an atheist. Vivian Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick's daughter, became a Scientologist. There's, there's Vivian right there. She's the little kid. Which the shoe 
kind of fits. While reading many interviews with Kubrick, I always find him to be a very cynical person. However, sometimes I catch this sense of idealism during the 60s. Uh, 2001 feels very optimistic. We seem to see a prescription to the sickness of the prevailing nihilism that is sweeping our lives, and the remedy seems to be the human drive to create and explore. The Superman doesn't feel apathy towards life. The Superman loves life and wants to reach the moon. He's just moved up one more place in a line that may end with a championship. It's a hard life, but to him it's worth all the hardship and the risk. To him it's worth everything. Cold logic dictates that there is no reason to go into space. It's cold, dangerous, and indifferent. It's safe to remain at home, to mope around, but Kubrick and Clark in 2001 invites us to gaze at the potential of man. Kubrick shows us space travel alongside fanciful classical music, imagery of opening eyelids and shifts in perspective. Kubrick shows us the world alive and invites us through that doorway. Essentially, what I'm trying to get at is that man's marriage to aliens will lead to a transformation and to a higher being, a Superman. The musical motif, the tone poem, Thus Spake Zarathustra, composed by Richard Strauss in 1895 and named in homage to the brilliant contemporary essay by Friedrich Nietzsche. I mean to convey, Strauss wrote, an idea of the evolution of the human race from its origin through its various phases of development, religious as well as scientific, up to Nietzsche's idea of the Superman. In his essay, Nietzsche muses, what is ape to man? A laughing stock, and just the same shall man be to Superman. Star child is Superman, not the victor in election or argument come to reform enemies and claim the spoils of war, but the offspring of instructed genetic progress whose way lies beyond the fears and scruples of his ancestors. The groundwork for this optimism that humbles daily goals is ourselves, one generation hence, treated so matter-of-factly in the film that we forget 2001 A Space Odyssey is mostly about our world. Now in this match cut, a very famous cut, we see a bone-like nuclear satellite. The visual poetry of the cut signals the will through the ages, that through the ages man has created something beyond himself, not only in wire holes, but in alien environments such as the moon. Look how Cooper demonstrates the will to power with these sets of ideas. Look how the monkeys are framed compared to the rest of the environment. There is never a moment where the apes are above the horizon. They almost look like they are buried underground. The environment takes a hold of them. The monkeys don't take a hold of their environment until they have the will to. Kubrick then frames the monkeys from the bottom up. From here, a ape, for the first time, moves into the foreground, meat in hand, and he displays power and agency in the frame. Next time you are watching a Kubrick film, ask yourself, who has the power and what is Kubrick doing with the camera? Compare this evolution to the transcendent rebirth at the end of the film, these aliens take astronaut Dave Bowman from man to old man to something above man, a child. Much like the beginning frames the rise of the sun, another dawn, another evolution like the graphs of standing up apes we see in our biology textbooks. So check out these little black signs here. Man is instructed by monoliths to use tools in the future, much like how the monolith instructed the monkeys. Future technological symbols are modeled to mirror their past ape counterparts. Tools that overcome resistance are normally signaled by bone motifs. Tools can be space satellites, pens, or utensils for food. Food is vital for survival, and the tools help the apes get food. We get a lot of monolith food motifs. We often see them as trays for serving, paralleling how the monolith helped the monkeys eat. One floats away from Floyd as if rejecting him, foreshadowing the monolith's rejection of his team. Another parallel is these iPad things, which transmit signals while the astronauts eat. This is most likely in reference to how the aliens transmit signals to the apes, allowing them to use the tools and therefore eat. 
In the year 2001, in a space wasteland, man isn't eating like he should and gets his food artificially. It's only when David Bowman is housed in the alien zoo does he get anything good to eat. At the table, David Bowman drops a glass, signaling his attention to his older self. During a brainstorming session surrounding the monolith's reveal, David Bowman's actor, Kira Dulia, came up with the idea of a glass breaking. Kubrick's initial idea had something to do with Bowman coming in and out of this doorway and seeing things move about until finally the monolith appeared, and that's still kind of in the movie. This continues to hammer home this door and perspective change motif. We even see Bowman walk up to the threshold of the bathroom and metaphorically become a monolith-like door. This most likely signals him becoming a doorway between man and Superman because the scene precedes his transfiguration. Anyways, the point is, is that Kier Dulier gave the suggestion that a glass should break and that it should cut to Bowman's next self. But even though it came from Kier Dulia, it might have some resonance with the rest of the film thematically. See, Kubrick was Jewish, at least ethnically. He grew up in the highly concentrated Jewish West Bronx. He must have known that breaking a glass is a part of Jewish marriage tradition. Funny enough, the glass breaks right before a marriage of sorts between man and alien into Superman. Also, remember the interviews I mentioned briefly? Well, one of the people that was supposed to be interviewed was a rabbi. So there may be Jewish spiritual ideas going on in this movie, which could account for the glass-breaking metaphor. Now, in the Bible itself, in the sixth chapter of Genesis, there is a rather mysterious reference to the sons of God who marry the daughters of men, and then a reference to something called Nephilim, which means, as it has been translated, the giants. Whereas a good part of Jewish explanation, exegesis, maintains that this was simply a race of strong men. There were certain Jewish sources, such as Philo in ancient Egypt, and Joseph, the Jewish general and historian, who saw in this a reference to a mysterious kind of race, which I suppose in contemporary terms might be described as an extraterrestrial race. There is another possible marriage that could meet man in 2001's story, and that's the marriage between machine and man. Machine could be created into something larger by man, much like how the aliens created man into something larger. When Hal is being disassembled, Hal sings a song about marriage called Daisy Bell. The bicycle built for two reminds us of the self-rolling wheel that is the Discovery spaceship. I think the lyrics are a bit more intentional than most people give it credit for. I'm half crazy. Worth mentioning, Daisy Bell was the first song sung by a computer. It was performed in 1961 at Bell Labs through speech synthesis by the IBM 7094. The question here I think that Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke is asking is rather standard science fiction fair. What is the limits of technology and our reliance on it? Should we dismantle our rocky marriage, or do we continue to go tandem on this bicycle built for two? One thing you may have missed is that Hal reads Poole's lips while playing chess. He also seems to divert Poole's attention from a move he could make. This means that, like man, Hal is an egotistical animal. One piece of interesting fan fiction might be, what if the aliens met Hal at the Stargate instead of David Bowman? Would Hal evolve with the aliens? As stated before, Kubrick was interested in AI. He even worked heavily on the film AI. Here, the aliens in AI, to me, are most likely not biological beings. They're, they're most likely machines that somehow evolved. Kubrick states, 
I'm not hostile towards machines at all. I just the opposite. In fact, looking into the distant future, I suppose it's not inconceivable that a semi-sentient robot computer subculture could evolve that might one day decide it no longer needed man. You've probably heard the story about the ultimate computer of the future for months. Scientists think of the first question to pose to it, and finally, they hit on the right one. Is there a god? After a moment of whirring and flashing lights, a card comes out punched with the word, There is now. Again, we are returning to the god concept, but rather than evolved aliens, it's evolved supercomputers. As in terms of what made Hal go haywire, it was the psychology report. You're working up your crew psychology report. Just a moment. Just a moment. I've just picked up a fault in the AE-35 unit. When Bowman was able to predict that Hal was running a psychology report, Hal was unable to evaluate the mission. Therefore, Hal saw that it wanted to carry out the mission on its own accord. But first, you know, the murders. Personally, I believe that Hal stands in for the technological anxieties of the era. Hal is a technological advancement, but an advancement that can be turned against us. The spaceship he inhabits looks like a bone. Bowman does not achieve superherodom because he is the most compassionate or self-sacrificial astronaut out there. There is no mention of God in 2001. 2001 is characterized by its wasteland, its abyss. The same goes for the monkey's desert. When we normally look at Western heroes, what normally characterizes them is traditional Judeo-Christian morality surrounding compassion and pity. David Bowman, on the other hand, is based not on his morality, but defined by his intelligence, bravery, and the will to survive. He is defined by his ability to overcome, not through just logic, but by human instinct. Later in the film, astronaut Frank Poole is murdered by the HAL 9000. We see David Bowman take his ship to retrieve a corpse, and here Bowman ventures far, 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 far off to save something that is essentially of no value. David Bowman could very well die here for nothing. This is what we normally would expect from a hero character. However, in order to save himself and to defeat Hal, he finds that he must go through an airlock. The problem is that to do so, he finds he has to discard Poole's body into the abyss. Like, Actually, take a moment to think about this. What other film have you seen a hero do something like that? This goes against the standard Judeo-Christian concepts of pity just to throw aside the body of someone for yourself. However, the nature of this egotistical act would be a moral act to Nietzsche. This is a shrugging off of all that is weakness. A dead body does not create value. To Nietzsche, it would just stink up the place. Bowman is forced to abandon his old values for the values of the Superman. Again, I want to reiterate the Superman's values. The Superman's values are of creation, such as strength and power, and the will to survive. Bad values are weakness, cowardice, or anything that doesn't lend people the ability to overcome resistance. It's only with the will to power Bowman is able to cross that threshold to overcome his machine adversary. And yes, we have another door motif. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. However, this pod bay door is much more than a door. We see Bowman escaping from his ship like a child being born underwater. Here, we see another rebirth from a door. To me, this cements the monolith being a symbolic doorway to intellectual rebirth. Hal himself looks like the pod bay door, as if he is an evolutionary threshold to be surpassed into a new rebirth. To open the pod bay doors, Bowman has to turn the eye of the door as if shifting his own perspective. Much like the apes will soon have to overcome the leopard, man has to overcome this new technology. Afterwards, Kubrick frames Bowman from a position of power. 
The camera is on the ground, and much like the ape self-overcoming, we see Bowman from up high. Bowman, the higher man, puts on a green helmet. A fun visual gag. Classic color for an alien. Even has two little peepers on top like he's evolving into a creature of higher intelligence before our eyes. His suit is now multicolored, like the Stargate as well. After ascending to heights previously unseen, Bowman kills the machine, much like Odysseus kills the Cyclops. David Bowman reminds us of two hero characters, King David, who slays Goliath, and Odysseus from The Odyssey, who could string a bow that others couldn't. I mean, his acceptance speech about Icarus <laughs> at the Director's Guild, I mean, nothing could be more perfect. The myth of Icarus and flying too high for success. But at the same time, I've never been certain whether the moral of the Icarus story should only be, as is generally accepted, don't try to fly too high, or whether it might also be thought of as Forget the wax and feathers. Let's make better wings. <laughs> you know, it's so perfectly Stanley. According to Kubrick, the very meaninglessness of life forces man to create his own meaning. Children, of course, begin life with an untarnished sense of wonder, a capacity to experience total joy at something as simple as the greenness of a leaf. But as they grow older, the awareness of death and decay begins to impinge on their consciousness and sadly erode their joy de vivre, their idealism, and their assumptions of immortality. As a child matures, he sees death and pain everywhere about him and begins to lose faith in the ultimate goodness of man. But if he's reasonably strong and lucky, he can emerge from this twilight of the soul into a rebirth of life's salon both because of and in spite of his awareness of the meaninglessness of life. He can forge a fresh sense of purpose and affirmation. He may not recapture the same pure sense of wonder he was born with, but he can shape something far more enduring and sustaining. Nietzsche also utilizes the symbols of children heavily in his work also spreads Zarathustra as enlightenment signifiers. Children and childhood signals a renewal to the joy of building. Nietzsche echoes Kubrick here. Innocence is a child and forgetfulness, a new beginning, a game, a self-rolling wheel, a first movement, a holy yes, yes for the game of creating my brothers, there is needed a holy yes unto life. Alright, that's a self-rolling wheel. In the script, there are children playing in low gravity. Most likely this was a way to link children as a higher perspective. Floyd was also supposed to tour a kindergarten with a bunch of young artists. One of the children here is painting a rainbow, which is reminiscent of the brilliant lights of the enlightened Stargate. Well, worthy of note is David Bowman, who will become a child. He paints a sleeping crewmate. While others slumber, Bowman is awake, creating art. All my students made me promise to send their best wishes too. You know, they talk about you all the time in the classroom. Frank, you're a big celebrity in the second grade. Stanley Kubrick's daughter makes an appearance here. She's the only child we really see outside these chimps who appear after the monkeys evolve to use tools. However, Vivian Kubrick's cameo doesn't quite beat the cameo of his cat in Eyes Wide Shut. They painted his cat! Vivian Kubrick is wearing a frayed dress as if she's in old 17th century garb. This reminds us of the 17th century paintings in the alien-like zoo. Her childlike presence and her communication with man foreshadows the ending. Also, her dress looks like the Stargate with the evolving stars that we see. She also has a childlike brooch. She even shows it off right before it's standing erect like the monkeys learn to do. Uh, the Stargate sequence doubles as a rebirth, which eventually has Bowman turned into a literal baby. 
But that's not all. Bowman here, upon exiting the Stargate, does so cold and shivering like a, like a child would be if it just had been born. The Stargate in itself is very much vaginal. Kubrick utilizes a lot of vaginal doorways with large-headed baby-like women coming out of them. Not to be outdone, tools are often phallic. It's not uncommon to associate penises as power signifiers. This is not the only time Kubrick has done this. Kubrick does this a whole lot. Okay, so the paintings in the alien-like zoo are a tetralogy of four paintings, which are actually knockoffs by the artist Fragonard. What matters here is that they surround courtship which is thematic as courtship leads to marriage. As we will continue to explore, the way aliens talk to humans may be on the non-verbal level, hence the symbolic paintings that litter the room. Carl Sagan advised Kubrick and how aliens might have looked, but it's not a radical idea that he advised Kubrick how aliens might have communicated. The Pioneer 10 and the Pioneer 11 spacecraft featured pictorial messages surrounding the basics of humanity for aliens to see. The project was also advised by Carl Sagan, just five years after 2001 in Space Odyssey. This is fascinating to me. Male, female, third rock from the sun, all visual. The sun is representative of enlightenment. Uh, Nietzsche himself began his magnum opus, thus spreaks Zarathustra, having the great sage call unto the sun and descend to the unenlightened masses below, which is similar to how the monolith descends to the apes. In Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche first associates the sun with the Apollonian side of expression. According to Nietzsche, this stands for harmony, progress, clarity, logic, and the principles of individuation. This is paramount for the apes' evolution, in which they discern the tapers as something more than mere creatures, soon discerning them to be food. They do much the same with the bone, which is turned into a tool to kill. The monkeys soon see themselves as a much more than apathetic beings, instead active participants in their own evolutionary destiny. But Nietzsche says we need the opposite too. We need irrationality, passion, instinct, and emotion. As Nietzsche once wrote, one must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. David Bowman did literally that. The man went through an airlock and turned off a symbol of pure logic. When the higher man throws up the bone, it cuts to a space satellite from Germany. The monkeys tossing it into the air to have it become a nuclear satellite seems to perhaps satirize how man hasn't evolved too far. This might come as a surprise to you, but Kubrick was kind of into satirizing world nuclear superpowers. Who knew? Our first human protagonist is shown to us sleeping. The emphasis of him sleeping is echoed by the cabin crew commenting on how he's always tired in the script. This shows us that he isn't a very enlightened creature, that he is still asleep, that he's a lower state of man. Hayward R. Floyd is his name, which is similar to the name Helen of Troy. Helen of Troy is a character in the Homeric epic, The Iliad. The Iliad is the epic poem that preceded the Odyssey. Helen of Troy was the woman at the center of the great War on Troy. Communication is a profound evolutionary advancement. The apes can only fight and grunt in their war hole. <laughs> but man can reason and talk things out. Now, are you sure you won't change your mind about that drink? No, I'm positive. In the film, after a deafening 20 minutes of silence, that's, that's unusual for even... Uh, 50 years later after the, after the film's release, a character crosses a barrier activated by the use of communication. Come to voice print identification. Here we see a literal gateway, another doorway, another doorway motif, and a panel with multiple languages, which signals to us communication between nations as a method of progress. But this communication motif doesn't stop at that threshold. It's a prominent thing in this telephone sequence and this modern-day wirehole sequence with the Russians, uh, American and Russians, uh, communication between nations. 
I want to point to the set design here because the chairs remind us of how the monkeys crouch around their watering holes. The Russians have been installing a relay, which continues this communication motif. We've uh, just spent three months calibrating the new antenna, Chilenka. And questioned why they can't communicate with the moon base on Clavius. We have been able to contact anyone for the past 10 days. Floyd lies about the goings on at the moon base. Sorry, Dr. Smith's love, but uh, I'm really not at liberty to discuss this. Worth noting is the design of the tables the Russians and the Americans sit around. It looks like a watering hole, but also a nuclear bomb erupting. Floyd's child wants a telephone for her birthday. A telephone. We got lots of telephones already. Once Floyd denies this gift to her, she then asks for a bush baby. A bush baby is an East African primate. In the script and book, the primates we follow at the beginning are from Africa. I'm guessing the film's apes are also from Africa because humans originally came from Africa historically. And hey, there's a zebra. Zebras are from Africa. This foreshadows the ending where the aliens keep primates as pets in a zoo until the humans transform into a baby, bush baby. The fact that the child is on a monolith-like screen might mean she is meant to represent the aliens either metaphorically or literally in the narrative. I don't know. As in childhood's end, the aliens posed as deceased family members. Either way, the denial of the gift of communication, which is the telephone, and the wish of the bush baby could perhaps signal that upon the denial of peace and communication among nations, well, for one thing, whenever you phone the base, all you can get is a recording which repeats that the phone lines are temporarily out of order. Aliens would step in and rebirth a primate. A bush baby. A bush baby. Well, we'll have to see about that. Which would then go and make peace on its own accord. We see David Bowman laying in a tree-like bed, so perhaps they see him as a primate, which is, you know, totally fair, considering we are. The moon monolith scene could signal the harm of a lack of communication. The sound is audio feedback, which is what happens when you get a output sound and turn it in on itself. This is a perfect metaphor for what Floyd is doing by not sharing news of the alien discovery to other nations. Aliens are giving off a signal and the nations are keeping it to themselves. This also doubles as a peaceful retaliation by the aliens as a way to signal their anger with the warring human race. So the propagandists are trying to cover up the monolith. Surrounding them are cinema screens, which are a blank white with nothing projected onto them as if they don't have anything to communicate. Dr. Floyd, have you any idea how much longer this cover story will have to be maintained? <laughs> I don't know, Bill. I, I suppose it'll be maintained as long as deemed necessary by the council. Floyd, with his quiet, calculated friendliness, wants to cover up these pesky monoliths. We can tell just by the set design. The screens are a stark white, broadcasting nothing at all. Or rather, how I read it, whitewashing of the black monolith. The suits circle around Floyd's podium, which is also a white monolith, as if these bureaucrats are circling around to deny their own evolution. The government does whatever is in their power to stop the people getting word of alien life. It takes until David Bowman is at Jupiter to even know anything about his mission. Hence, this is probably why Haywood R. Floyd is given the name similar to Helen of Troy because man is on his way to nuke himself and the aliens have the potential to stop them. The refusal to give news of this alien life may lead to nuclear war. Much like Helen of Troy sowed discord that led to the Trojan War. So once again, we have a phone that Floyd isn't willing to buy his daughter, which might be in line with the refusal to tell the people about the alien discovery and how his contact will probably go poorly. But here we also get a birthday a birthday Floyd is not able to attend. I'm sorry, sweetheart, but I can't. Why not? Well, you 
know, Daddy's traveling. Very sorry about it, but I just can't. This foreshadows the denial of his rebirth when he meets the monolith. Frank Poole gets a birthday message as well with a cake he is unable to eat. Sorry, you can't join us. Haywood R. Floyd and Frank Poole will not get a rebirth. They will not experience contact with aliens. His parents friend Ray also couldn't make it to his birthday either. Ray and Sally were going to be here too, but at the last minute Ray's back went bad on them again. Ray had a problem with his back, not allowing him to come. <laughs> Moments later, Poole approaches the communication relay like a rising sun, and similar to a ray of light, he embarks from the sun. Much like Frank Poole's parents' friend Ray, but at the last minute Ray's back went bad on him again. Poole had problems with his back, or rather Poole is attacked behind his back. Poole dies and is unable to experience a rebirth. Notice how David Bowman shields himself from the sun. The sun most likely representing the enlightened HAL 9000. A little IBM logo there. Sure means nothing. While Frank wears orange sunglasses while he bathes in artificial light, Hal himself is a artificial light, perhaps signifying Frank having the sun in his eye and not seeing the attack coming from Hal. As stated before, Hal gets divorced in the end after killing Frank Poole. This is fitting as Frank Poole's parents' friend Sally is Ray's wife. In the sequel book, the Sal 9000 would be the Hal 9000 successor. Anyways, this leopard here also foreshadows the attack on Frank Poole. Another lower being getting attacked by a higher being while its back is turned. The leopard's eye is also very similar. Thank you, Miss Turner. Thank you. Get it? Because she's on a base that turns. I think Mr. Miller of uh, Station Security is supposed to be meeting me. Get it, Miller? Mr. Miller? As in, as in a mill? Because mills are round, and they move around cyclically. When the monkeys first are greeted by the monolith, they turn their heads. They do much the same while learning to use tools. We have interviews confirming the deliberation of this gesture from the actor who played the monkey. This is a universal sign of trying to better understand a thing. Stanley Kubrick does this exact same motion with the camera itself, meaning during key scenes normally surrounding futuristic concepts such as anti-gravity and leaps in understanding, we get perspective shifts. Much like how the apes turn their heads to better understand how to use tools, Kubrick shifts our perspective to new technology and to the new future prospects of humanity. The shift in perspective primes us for the transhumanist revolution and a reevaluation of life's a lot. When I use the phrase enlightenment, I mean exactly that, a enlightenment to a new sense of purpose away from the modernistic nihilistic funk of the 20th century. Kubrick shifts his camera as a reevaluation of what is familiar, like if one is perceiving the world anew like a child. To accomplish the effect of weightlessness, cameras are placed in radically unorthodox mounts. Optical engineers had to design equipment which would meet the requirements of Kubrick's bizarre and incisive imagination. So note how camera shifts surround only baby-like women retrieving monolith food and the crewmates of the Discovery. We don't see shifts surrounding unenlightened bureaucrats. They are framed normally. To Nietzsche, a childlike sense of wonder is a major aspect of the Superman and is the final metamorphosis to the higher self. Sometimes sets are upside down, so it invites us to turn our heads while watching it. The biggest and most alien perspective shifts we see is in the Stargate sequence. This shows us a 90 degree turn and then a 180 degree turn where everything is upside down. This is not the only time Kubrick utilizes this type of perspective shift to represent changes in consciousness. He, he did so in his very first feature film, Fear and Desire, after a crazed soldier shoots a beautiful hostage. 
In a more experimental scene in Killer's Kiss, Kubrick utilizes negatives to signify a altered state of consciousness. In 2001, the audience is subject to the same visual language. Their understanding of the world has been flipped horizontally, vertically, in multiple colors. Look to David Bowman's Zoo Room. It's a inverted shot of what we saw much earlier in our journey. There are so many inversions as there are so many shifts in consciousness. The whole film surrounds overcoming space, which is historically in line with the overcoming of the moon, Man's Next Evolution, 1969. Uh, the film starts with the dark side of the moon and ends on the lightened side of the moon. It's another inversion. So we have spiritual rebirth, but we also have spiritual slumber, or rather nihilism, which is what we, we want to counteract. Here we want spiritual rebirth, we, we want renewal, we want the Superman. The crewmates here in hypersleep may signify a last man's lack of drive to push forward. The rest of the crew is pushing themselves forward to the outreaches of space, and these crew members are taking a nap. At one point, these crew members were supposed to wake up according to some testimonials, but Kubrick ultimately decided against it. That's why we see little instructions to wake them up. Their death does draw parallels with Homer's Odyssey, though, as all of Odysseus's crew all die. The color coding of their vitals are an interesting detail here. It reminds us of the brilliant lights of the Stargate sequence. However, Bowman transcends these colors like moving through a gate, as in he is affirming life or going beyond life. Bowman dresses up in multiple colors once he disassembles Hal, so this isn't the only time we see these color pairings. Anyways, speaking of sleeping, Arthur C. Clarke's sequel book and movie characterizes all animals that are intelligent to have the ability to dream. I would like to ask a question. What is it? Will I dream? Of course you will dream. All intelligent creatures dream, nobody knows why. This motif is present in the first film. When Dr. Poole is asked what it's like in hibernation, Poole is quick to answer, as if he's quite familiar with it. Exactly like being asleep, you have absolutely no sense of time. The only difference is that you don't dream. Probably alludes to the absence of intelligent life and the kind of nihilistic inability to strive for greatness. I've always viewed Poole to be less smart than Bowman. He's introduced to us by being bested by Hal in chess. When speaking to Hal, Frank seems to underestimate Hal's intelligence, giving him a sly, subtle snark that David doesn't give him. Listen, Hal. There's never been any instance at all of a computer error occurring in a 9000 series, has there? None whatsoever, Frank. During one scene, Kubrick has Bowman stand erect and Poole standing horizontal. The standing up of characters is a motif that goes throughout the entire film, symbolizing evolution and intelligence. When our protagonist apes stand up with his eyes wide open, other apes have blackened out eyes. This symbolizes awareness and intelligence. A great gag here is the pouring of coffee, an awakening symbol. It doesn't make sense that they're pouring hot coffee on the moon, but the camera cuts away before we can see it burn everyone. Perhaps it's a massive oversight, but I doubt it. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, click on that like button and subscribe button. Or if you want to be a real Superman, guide your symbolic enlightened eyeball spaceship to planet Patreon. You could support future projects such as these. Or if you want more Kubrick, I have another long form video essay surrounding my favorite Stanley Kubrick film, A Clockwork Orange.